Pennsylvania. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to address the amendment that I have. I will uh, formally ask to call it up uh, in a few moments, uh, but uh, I want to say a few words about it. And I'd like to start by uh, a little bit of background and reminder of where, how we got here and the circumstances that brought us to this point. And it all started, of course, with a completely unsustainable national flood insurance program. I don't think there's any dispute that this program is massively in debt. It's completely, it's been completely underwater. It was insolvent. And there was no prospect for this to write, to write itself because of the massive subsidies for homeowners of, of all stripes. Um, by the way, in addition to being fiscally insolvent and therefore a, uh, a huge drain for taxpayers, it has a lot of very bad incentives when you subsidize homes that are built in dangerous places. You subsidize and encourage homes to be rebuilt there, homes to be bought in places that are just dangerous and costly. And so there are problems inherent. The CBO uh, was very clear about this. This program was not going to be able to honor its commitments. That's what happens when a program like this is insolvent and is unreformed. Um, people who think they've got insurance for their home end up discovering one day that they don't because it's ins of its insolvency. And so along came the Bigot Waters approach to reform the National Flood Insurance Program, and to put it in a position where it would actually be solvent and it would actually be able to honor the policies that people are paying for. Um, it was September of 2011 that the Senate Banking Committee took up the reforms, and they passed it with a voice vote. In other words, there was no dissent. There was no objection to the Bigger Waters reforms. Now, that was, of course, after many hearings. This had been this has been discussed at length for many years before we got to that point, but we did. We passed it in the Banking Committee. And in June of 2012, so less than two years ago, Bigger Waters, the, the flood insurance reform program, was wrapped into another bill. It was the MAP 21, a transportation bill. It was wrapped into that, and it passed, and it passed with overwhelming support. As a matter of fact, as it happens, every single Democrat who was in the chamber and who is a member of the Senate voted in favor of the bigger water reforms. I think in part because they understood that this program needed to be reformed. And I think we all believe that this program needs to be on a fiscally sustainable place. So the final passage of that bill uh, less than two years ago required the reforms of bigger waters, which includes as central to those reforms that over time, Everybody who participates in the National Flood Insurance Program will eventually be paying actuarially sound rates, rates that actually reflect the risk of their home. So the taxpayers wouldn't be on the hook and they wouldn't be subject to the worry about whether this program is going to go away altogether. So that's where we were when, lo and behold, we start to discover that for some people, premium increases are gonna be very, very dramatic. I've heard a lot from Pennsylvanians. This is a problem with the bigger waters reform. One of the problems that I suspect a lot of folks did not anticipate was that the premium spikes would be quite substantial and they'd happen over a pretty short period of time. There is a phase in under the bigger water uh, reforms, but it's quick and it's very problematic for that relatively small handful of people who would be adversely affected because it turns out that the remapping determines that they're in a higher risk profile than had previously been understood, or if they built their home prior to the initial mappings, they wouldn't be subject to the premium increase, but upon sale of their home, the premium increase would go into effect, and it'd go into effect immediately, and that, of course, can have a devastating impact on the value of a person's home. So I, I want to just be very clear. There's no question in my mind that if we don't do anything, if we simply leave bigger waters alone, that has an unacceptable impact on people who are adversely affected in the form of premium increases that are way too big, way too quickly. And that's not, that's not the right outcome. That's not, we shouldn't settle for that. I know cases in Pennsylvania where people have, are facing thousands of dollars in increase uh, in some cases, it's immediate. In the case where they are going to be selling their home, the new buyer would face that immediately. In other cases, it's phased in very quickly. So 
The Menendez approach, the underlying bill that we're debating today, deals with this. But it deals with this in the wrong way. It deals with this by completely suspending all the reforms. It completely dispenses with the idea that we should move towards an actuarially sound program. It says for four years there'll be no change in premiums. Now, it's hard not to see this as a measure that's designed to kill the reform. And I understand that it's painful to have any premium increase, but to say that the response should be to abandon any effort to move to a fiscally sound, actuarially based program, I, I, that just can't be right. To do that is to completely throw out the reforms that took so many years to get there. Um, and by the way, it doesn't provide any certainty for the homeowners that it's meant to protect. But for four years, nothing happens. And after the fourth year, nobody knows what happens. I know the, the intent for some to continue indefinitely without making any changes. But that is not a solution. This is an insolvent program. What that means is we will get to the day relatively soon, according to CBO, when the National Flood Insurance Program will simply be unable to honor the commitments that it's made. It will not have the resources. It will not have the borrowing authority. It will run out of money. And people who then get their home flooded will find it of little comfort that their premium was a little lower when it turns out there's no, there's no benefit to be paid. There is no resources for them to rebuild. So this, this just doesn't work. Um, and it's not just me who observes this problem with the underlying Menendez bill. As a matter of fact, the President of the United States has weighed in on this, and I will have a quote here from a statement of administrative policy that they put out two days ago in response, directly referring to this bill, uh, by identifying it by number. They're, this is the bill they're talking about, the Menendez bill, and one of the things that they say is, Delaying implementation of these reforms, the reforms they're talking about are the bigger order reforms, delaying the implementation of these reforms, as the Menendez bill would do, would further erode the financial position of the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, which is already $24 billion in debt. This delay would also reduce FEMA's ability to pay future claims made by all policyholders. This is the President of the United States. His administration has looked at the Menendez bill, and this is their conclusion. This doesn't work. This doesn't work for policyholders. It doesn't work for taxpayers. It doesn't work for anybody. There's another problem that I would point out with the Menendez bill. It wouldn't work if it were to become law for these reasons, but it's not going to become law. The administration's made it clear they don't support it. The Speaker of the House has made it abundantly clear he will not put a bill on the House floor that guts the reforms of bigger orders. The chairman, the House chairman of the Banking Committee, who has jurisdiction over this, has made it abundantly clear he's not going to move a bill that does away with these fiscal reforms. So voting for the Menendez bill, if your goal is to do something to help homeowners who are facing premium increases, a vote for the Menendez bill does nothing because that bill's going nowhere. The administration wouldn't support it, doesn't support it. They've said so. The House is not even going to take it up. So if your goal is to do something for constituents who are facing a big premium increase, and that, frankly, that is a big part of my goal, the Menendez bill doesn't cut it. That's going nowhere. What the administration said would work and what House leadership are willing to, to work with us on would be to phase in these premium increases more gradually because everybody acknowledges the premium increases are occurring too, too quickly and that needs to change. So this, this is another quote from that same statement of administration policy on that same bill. What they said was the administration strongly supports a phased transition to actuarially sound flood insurance rates. Now, they didn't refer to my amendment, but this is exactly what my amendment does. It phases this in gradually so as to minimize the pain, allow people an opportunity to adjust, allow people the time to maybe mitigate the risk, 
and still maintain the integrity, the fiscal integrity of the program so that it actually can pay the claims that will be submitted to it that surely will be submitted. Um, let me just run through quickly exactly what the amendment does and doesn't do because there's been some confusion about this. Um, it's act our, our amendment actually retains very significant portions of the underlying Menendez bill because parts of it made a lot of sense. So uh, section one is just the title, section two are definitions unchanged, section three is where we phase the premium increases in gradually rather than suspending them altogether. That's the big difference. Section four of the Menendez bill is an affordability study and report. It requires FEMA to complete this study, as Bigger Waters does, within two years of the enactment of the bill. We leave that intact. I think that's a good idea. We need that. My amendment would not affect that whatsoever. The Menendez bill also provides some funding, additional funding, for the affordability study. It lifts the cap that was set before. My amendment wouldn't change that. I think that we need to lift that cap. Section six. six this is a measure that provides funds to reimburse homeowners when they challenge the redrawing. So when the map, a new map comes out and someone's house is deemed to be in a more risky place and therefore the premium is higher, a homeowner can challenge that. And if the homeowner wins under the Menendez language, which I support and stays in this bill under my amendment, the homeowner would be reimbursed the cost of that challenge. And Senator King, from Maine had a very good suggestion, I think, which is if a community chooses to challenge the mapping because they think there was a mistake made, they think it was inaccurate and it adversely affects them, they too, that community too, would be reimbursed for its cost if it turns out to be successful in its challenge. I agree with that. We've incorporated that into our amendment. Section seven addresses flood protection system. This is a very important part of what the Menendez bill does. I fully support it, and that is this. Uh, under current law, one of the problems is in order to, for a community or a, or a home, homeowner, to fully benefit from risk mitigation that they may have done, a levy that may have been built or a dam or some other risk mitigation, in order to fully benefit from that, the federal government has to have paid for some portion of it. That's ridiculous. What difference does it make who paid for it? If it's been built and it's providing protection, that's all that should matter. Uh, this language would achieve that, the Menendez uh, bill achieves that, and my amendment incorporates that. We keep that intact as well. Um, section, uh, section 8 uh, treats flood-proofed residential basements, uh, addresses that. Our amendment doesn't change that. Section 9 uh, creates a, a designation of a flood insurance advocate. Again, my amendment makes no change to that. Um, section 10, uh, Senator Blunt uh, had an amendment that would change the remodeling trigger for loss subsidies from 30% to 50% of a home's value. We incorporate Senator Blunt's amendment into our own, so that's there. Uh, Senator Hagan had an amendment uh, to exempt uh, escrow requirements for flood insurance payments. We, we fully incorporate that into my amendment as well. Senator Rubio had an amendment also that was accepted by the managers. It's in ours. Um, so really what it comes down to, the difference between my amendment and the Menendez approach is one keeps us on a path of reform, keeps us on a path to an actuarially sound, fiscally responsible flood insurance program whereby the flood insurance program is actually able to pay its claims. And the Menendez bill dispenses with it. It dispenses with the most important, most fundamental reform. The other part that we do is we soften the blow. If your concern is with these homeowners who are facing these huge premiums, my amendment's the only way that we're gonna actually achieve that help for those folks because this is the only legislative approach that has a chance of actually becoming law. Um, by the way, um, in addition to its problems with the other body and the administration, the Menendez bill is subject to a budget point of order because it increases our deficit and forces more government borrowing, subject to a point of order. I don't know that it can sustain that. Uh, I, I don't know it can defeat a budget point of order. And that's an important issue because our approach is fiscally sound. We're not subject to a budget point of order. What we do is we say, 
sure, the longer delay in the phase-in of the premium increases costs the flood insurance program some money until you get to the point where people have reached the level where they're paying actual hourly sound uh, rates. But we fully offset that with a very modest surcharge on all flood insurance policies in the country. It's about $40 per year in the first year, the most expensive year, unless your income is over a half a million dollars a year, in which case it's about $80. That's it. And it goes down after that because over time, as the higher premiums gradually are phased in, the loss to the program is diminished, and therefore the surcharge goes down with it. But um, let's be very clear. The maximum that anybody would be paying is about $40 a year, unless your income is over a half a million dollars a year, in which it would, case it would be $80 a year. Um, look, I'll just wrap up, Mr. President. Um, I, I just think that we just can't continue to ignore all of the fundamental mandatory spending problems that we have. When we actually go through a long and painful and deliberative systematic process to reform a program, for us to then walk away within two years and say, never mind, we're not going to have any reform, is just so disappointing and irresponsible. We've got bigger challenges facing us. If we can't deal with this, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, again. I fully acknowledge that we've got to soften the blow for people who are going to face much higher premiums. My amendment does that. And, and the way we do that is by ensuring that nobody's premium could go up by more than 25 percent. In the case of people who would face a big increase, under my approach, it'll take many years of gradual phasing in before they would actually be forced to pay that higher actuarially sound rate. If they think that rate is unfairly high, they can challenge it. Or they can leave the program and buy private insurance. They could do that too. But to suggest that we're going to just do nothing after having put the reforms in place, I think would be a big mistake. Um, Mr. President, there are a lot of groups that are supporting my amendment. Um, I've got a, uh, I've got a list here I'm going to run through quickly. The National Resource Defense Council, the National Wildlife Federation, the Nature Conservancy, National Taxpayers Union, Taxpayers for Common Sense. National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, the Reinsurance Association of America, American Rivers, the National Fire Protection Association, National Lease Housing Association, the R Street Institute, American Consumer Institute, Americans for Prosperity, Americans for Tax Reform, the Coalition to Reduce Spending, the Cost of Government Center, Councils for Citizen Against Government Waste, Freedom Works, the National Taxpayers Union, Taxpayers for Common Sense, the Taxpayer Protection Alliance. So as you can see, there's a combination of fiscal watchdog uh, folks that are very concerned about fiscal prudence, as well as um, people who are concerned about environmental, uh, environmental integrity. There's other groups coming on uh, continuously. As I mentioned, uh, every Democrat who voted on the Bigger Waters reform voted in favor of it. Um, what my amendment does is it preserves the integrity of the reform while softening the blow for the people who would be affected by it. So. I, I, I think this is just a very, very important, although modest step in, in, in doing these two things. And, and Mr. President, I'm going to uh, ask unanimous consent to temporarily set aside the pending amendment so that I may call up my amendment 2707 with the modification, which is at the desk. Without objection, the clerk will report. Without objection, the clerk will report.